Every day, about 165,000 people die in the world. That's over 60 million people every year. This is comparable to the population of either the United Kingdom or France. And of course, most of them are buried in cemeteries. But as the world's population grows and urbanization increases, cemeteries are running out of space. According to some predictions due to population growth, by the end of this century, the planet might turn into one vast cemetery. But what if this really happens? What if we run out of burial space? And how can we prevent this? According to scientists' estimates, about 109 billion people have lived and died in the last 192,000 years. It is these 109 billion people who created the world in which we live today. All this civilization, all the knowledge, the technologies, the tools that allow us to watch YouTube, all of it is thanks to these people. But despite all the advancements in medical technologies and healthcare, the average human lifespan does not exceed 74 years. Even though there are long livers after 120 years, there will be no one left whom you would know. Just imagine there won't be a single person left on the entire planet whom you could know. The world will be inhabited by completely different people. And you, like today's population, will most likely end up in a cemetery. If, of course, there is space there. Of course, cemeteries are important. They hold immense value in our lives and culture. For many cultures, cemeteries are sacred and respected places where people can honor the departed and maintain a connection with the past. Moreover, cemeteries also serve as historical reminders, telling us about past times, cultural traditions, and customs. However, with the growth of the population and the increase in mortality, the issue of space becomes more pressing, especially in large cities where cemeteries occupy land that could be used for other purposes, such as housing or recreation. Additionally, they require constant financial investments, maintenance, and security. But what's even worse, traditional burials introduce organic and heavy metals into our soil and water systems. Furthermore, cemeteries generate greenhouse gas emissions produced during E, the decomposition of bodies and the use of chemical substances for embalming. But this problem is by no means new. For example, by the end of the 18th century, all the old cemeteries in Paris had become overcrowded. To make space for new burials, long deceased individuals were exhumed and reinterred. The old bones were tightly packed and placed in abandoned limestone quarries deep beneath the city. There lie the remains of more than six million people, Today, these catacombs are a creepy yet incredibly popular tourist attraction. In densely populated Hong Kong, they took a completely different approach. In this city where land is an incredibly expensive resource, cemeteries were built on mountain slopes in vertical forms. However, the problem hasn't gone away and is still relevant both for Hong Kong and many other major metropolises on the planet, such as New York, London, Tokyo. The cost of graves here is rising so steeply that in the near future, burial in a coffin might become an exclusive privilege of the wealthy urban elite. I know the saying says you can't take it with you, but here's an example from former mayor of New York, Ed Koch. Five years before his death in 2013, he bought a plot in a Manhattan cemetery for $20,000. Koch commented that it was a good investment because cemetery plot prices are rising, unlike the stock market. An interesting perspective on the financial side of things, isn't it? Dying in the USA is certainly not the cheapest affair. Similarly, in China, prices can range from thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. A similar situation arises in Germany. For instance, in the UK in 2022, the average burial cost was about $11,000. But undoubtedly, the most expensive place to die is Japan. The average funeral cost there is about $27,000. But what if you don't have that kind of money? After all, people need to be buried regardless of their wealth. And many countries have their own ways of solving this problem. For example, secondhand graves are offered where old bodies are buried deeper and new bodies are buried on top of them. It's like using the top bunk of a bunk bed when no one is sleeping on it, says Julie Rugg from the Cemetery Research Group at the University of York. This method, known as reclamation, accounts for about 30% of burials in England and Wales today. Without it, cemeteries would already be overcrowded. A similar approach is practiced in Australia, where due to a lack of burial space, old cemeteries are reused, or older remains are reburied deeper and a new body is buried on top. In Brazil and Israel, as in some other countries, they experiment with a new type of grave, skyscrapers specially built to accommodate the deceased. Memorial Necropole Ecumenica in Santos, Brazil, is the tallest vertical cemetery in the world. The necropolis rises almost 350 feet and contains 25,000 graves. In addition, the complex features memorial and restrooms, 
a 24-hour restaurant, parking, a chapel, a garden, and even a car museum. Furthermore, burial spaces are increasingly being rented out in different countries. After the soft tissues decompose, bones are moved to a communal grave or mausoleum, freeing up burial space for reuse. The complete mineralization process of a body takes between 10 to 30 years and depends on various factors, including soil and climatic conditions, cause of death, embalming presence, and more. However, the skeletonization of a body in the ground occurs much faster, usually within two or four years. When soft tissues completely decompose, bones can be reburied in a more compact grave. Thus, spending a few years in a mausoleum is enough for skeletonization and subsequent reburial of bones. Certainly, cremation is the most common alternative to traditional coffin burials. In countries with ancient traditions, cremation is conducted on a funeral pyre, while in the Western world it takes the form of a ritual before burying the ashes. For example, as of 2020, 78% of funerals in the UK are carried out through cremation. In the United States, cremation has also become the most popular burial choice in recent years. This method allows relatives to place ashes in a small urn or bury them in a small plot of land. Furthermore, it's becoming an increasingly popular option in countries with limited land space. In Hong Kong, cremation is used in over 90% of cases. This method is considered more environmentally friendly and affordable compared to traditional burials. And of course, there's a demand for those giant columbariums I mentioned earlier. At the same time, some companies advertise more creative ways to use ashes, such as pressing them into a vinyl record, using them to create a coral reef or compressing them into diamonds. Who knows, maybe this truly offers loved ones a pleasant memory of the deceased. By the way, there's a belief that crematories heavily pollute the environment, leading to emissions including carbon dioxide and possibly mercury. Most filtration systems are aimed at reducing metal content and solid particles, as well as nitrogen oxides, says Paul Seiler, head of marketing at Matthews Environmental Solutions, a company that manufactures cremation equipment. The filters used in cremation systems do not neutralize CO2 formed during the body burning process, including the gas produced as a byproduct of heating the body to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit or more. And one cremation, according to estimates, produces about 500 pounds of carbon dioxide. This means approximately 360,000 tons of CO2 emissions are generated annually from cremation in the U.S. alone. However, considering there are around 3,500 crematories in the U.S., is this a significant amount? Write your thoughts in the comments, and I'll leave you with this comparison. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, a typical passenger car emits about 4.6 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere annually. For Americans aiming to reduce their carbon footprint even after death, aquamation or alkaline hydrolysis might be an appealing option. This method dissolves the body in water, reducing the carbon footprint compared to traditional cremation. It also produces an organic liquid that can be used in agriculture as fertilizer. In some U.S. states, other alternative burial methods are permitted, such as body composting. The body is covered with natural materials like straw or sawdust, and within approximately three to seven weeks, due to microbial activity, it decomposes into soil. And as for what to do with this soil, the relatives of the deceased have the right to decide. For instance, you can plant some cucumbers there. Actor Luke Perry was buried in a mushroom death suit, designed by California designer J. Rime Lee. Mushroom spores hasten decomposition and neutralize toxins released by the human body. A little later, the Dutch developed a living coffin made of fungal mycelium. The living cocoon was created by Bob Hendricks in collaboration with researchers from Delft University of Technology and the Naturalis Museum of Natural History. It's already part of several funeral companies' coffin collections. The deceased person will be placed inside a coffin filled with moss and mycelium. Hendrix expects such a coffin to complete the composting process within two to three years. If you don't want to turn your relative into compost, you can opt for natural burials. These so-called green burials occur in forests or meadows using biodegradable coffins made of cardboard, banana leaves, and other natural materials. Relatives can easily locate the burial site with the help of GPS. However, I don't quite understand how this method differs from the traditional one. After all, this method is quite common and has historical and religious roots. For instance, according to nature, the earliest known human burial dates back to the Middle Stone Age, about 74 to 82,000 years ago, involving a child in what is now Kenya. And in Japan, they've created virtual cemeteries. Moreover, there have even been attempts to make it possible to visit a cemetery in the metaverse. 
How about transforming into a reef? Well, it's an interesting alternative to becoming part of the marine ecosystem. The reef is designed to resemble the mythical city of Atlantis and serve as a habitat for corals and fish. It is planned that the reef will accommodate up to 125,000 remains and will be open to visitors who wish to pay their respects or explore the underwater landscapes. If and if you suddenly decide to end your existence in a truly epic way and journey to the heavens, no, I'm not talking about paradise and all that, you can indeed send your ashes into space through the Elysium Space Project. But there's a catch, of course. Despite the successful launch of Elysium Star, a series of 1U CubeSats aboard the Falcon 9 rocket, it remains in limbo due to licensing issues. It's entirely unclear whether it will return to Earth as a falling star, as the company promised. However, Elysium Space is already planning its next mission, which involves using Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander to create lunar mausoleums. This mission will preserve the ashes of the departed on the surface of the moon, providing a new and unique way to immortalize the memory of the deceased. Who knows? Maybe Musk will be inspired by this idea and send himself to Mars. So, there are plenty of diverse burial options, all depending on the size of your wallet and preferences. Perhaps it's worth considering your preferences while you're still alive. What do you think? Write in the comments.